Well, boys, looks like you started the fun without me. You're all sick. Every last one of you. We're going to need a bigger gun. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom, go boom. My name is Eric. I am here today with Italian horror expert, apparently, Michael Kester. Yeah, sure. That's uh, what I'm, that's recent Italian horror expert, mm-hmm. Michael Kester. You're just going to be my Italian language correspondent Great. in this show. Because Perfect. I'm already telling you right now that I'm going to butcher every name and Italian term for the rest of the show. Perfect. So what are these accidental Italian movies we're doing on the show? We're doing Stage Fright and Creepers or Deliria and Phenomena. Uh, can we just do Stage Fright and Phenomena? Is that okay? I would prefer that, yeah. I don't know how we're going to do this. But uh, that wasn't the intention to pair up two Italian horror films. Uh, in my mind, I you know I wanted to do... Um, some kind of Argento something. I don't even know where to start. There's all the weird witch shit I haven't seen, so I don't know where to go with that. And I was thinking, all right, we've been wanting to get one of these 80s slasher things on here for a while. I don't know. Let's do the one with the owl guy. Mm -hmm. And I forgot about all of the tie-ins between the two movies. So it's just one of those things where the double feature, the movies were drawn together. These are also artsy slashers, though. I think that's the thing that was probably the most obvious. Yeah, they're they're definitely varying levels of art. Art, it, there's varying levels of an art to slasher ratio in each yes, film. Yes, and we'll get to that stuff. Also, another part of it was you showed me stage fright, and I was looking for something crazier. So I will see you, your owl head, yeah. and raise you some telekinetic bugs, apparently. Uh, we're going to spoil both of these films. I think I just did that. But you don't actually care what's in the films, right? I mean, no one is anyone going to be mad that I spoiled these films? Oh, boy. <laughs> don't <laughs> okay. even get me started on that. All right, whatever. But I, I think if you haven't seen these movies, you're probably you're just fucking around listening to this show, so you're fine. But if you think you're going to get spoiled and be mad, rather than send me an angry email, why don't you just go ahead and use the chapters to uh, skip ahead? So we're going to talk about stage fright first. If you haven't seen that, skip over to Creepers or Phenomena or whatever the fuck you want to call there's it. There's actually only one film, but you made yeah. it sound like there's three. <laughs> yeah, there's a ton of films on the show today. Creepers and Phenomena, that's the same thing. Creepers was the U.S. title and the shorter version, which maybe is the version you should see. You think so. I don't. I don't, I don't know. I, well, I haven't seen. Neither of us have seen both versions, I, so we don't know. Well, when we get to it, I'll explain why I don't want to see a shorter version of the film. All right, so I guess you've been sufficiently uh, warned and instructed. Um, let's start with the... All right, so here it is. First Italian name. Are you ready? Sure. I believe it is a Michael Suave film, but I could be completely wrong. And it is called Deliria, or Stage Fright. Stage Fright's the U.S. title. Here's something uh-huh. that blows my mind already. They decided to retitle the movie Stage Fright in the United States, despite the fact that there's already the Hitchcock Stage Fright, which is yeah. usually why they retitle this shit, because there's already one that exists over here. So this is a director that got started doing second unit stuff for Dario Argento. Uh, I think he got started on Tenebrae. And he didn't actually do anything full length until he did the the World of Horror documentary, which was about Dario Argento. Mm-hmm. So someone who's kind of a fan of Argento stuff, starts working with Argento, starts uh, filming the behind the scenes stuff, putting together a documentary. And it wasn't until Stage Fright that he was doing his first full feature. He also did Cemetery Man, which we'll get to. We'll cover that later in the show. Um, but we can see him within the film as well. He's the cop who's outside in the patrol car. I'm going to guess he's the younger cop. Uh Uh-huh. The James Dean cop. Yeah, the James Dean, not the Marlon Brando cop. So while we have all this newfound knowledge about Italian shit, this starts at the heart as a slasher movie. Mm -hmm. I think that's where the real roots are. Uh, And this was something you showed to me. So, yeah, I mean, it's everybody on the show fucking knows that I did a slasher thing and it's kind of consumed most of my film, my film knowledge uh up till up until i learned about kaiju which yeah I'm, and, i will force that is, you to put on the show sure sure so stage fright is one of the it's one of the films that if you you fucking google slashers enough and you scroll past the first 10 pages which are all look how many jason t-shirts we can yeah make, right you finally get to things like my bloody valentine house on sorority everything that's getting remade yeah. right now yeah. essentially the ones everything that that's been getting remade for the last decade the stuff that you don't realize are actually remakes prom night sorority row stuff like that 
So Stage Fright, yet to be remade, was yeah. one of these, you know, secret slasher films, let's right. call it. One of the one-offs, as it would be if we were in the world of Behind the Mask. And it fulfills the checklist of the standard slasher, even mm-hmm. though it seems like it's going to absolutely destroy some of the rules. Yeah, yeah. Um, the one thing that always stands out to me, it's been a long time since I've seen this film. So when we watched it again, toward the end, she picks up a gun. And I think I, oh, I'm tired. I'm, it's a sleepy day for me. So I started singing about how she was breaking the rules. And you often have songs to accompany the, uh, the films we watch. That's yeah, no secret. That's unfortunately for our listeners, you're not watching the films with me because a lot of times I come up with theme songs for two characters. Right. Uh, we'll get to one that actually I, I'm copywriting right now that we did during Phenomena. But she picks up a gun and I go, ooh, breaking the rules, yes. not allowed. But then there's, first off, the gun doesn't work. Yeah. So immediately we go for an eye stab right back to the formula. Yeah. But some of the other stuff, the really, you know, the rootsy, you don't realize it slasher formula stuff mm-hmm. totally comes into play here. The name yeah. is one that stands out to me. So the name ends up being not an anonymous owl, as we'll get to, but Irving Wallace. Right. Irving Wallace is the owl killer. And so I'm not going to go and preach that this is slasher canon yet. But now that I'm preaching it, I expect it everybody yeah. to assume that this is the truth. Listen up. Slasher's names, the names of the killers, have to fill a two-syllable rule. All right, first, so let's do the rundown. I mean, what is the... We well, have... the thing is that the first name and the last name each need two syllables. All right, four syllables total, two syllables in each. Um, we have a Freddy Krueger. Yeah. We have Jason Voorhees. Jason Voorhees. Leslie Vernon, as you uh, mentioned earlier. Um, what I guess everybody fills Victor this checklist. Crowley, yeah, there's Harry another. Warden, mm-hmm. Michael Myers. It's all of them. And now Irving Wallace. It doesn't stop there. I mean, we have the station wagon. Sure, the, the station uh, wagon. The wh- why are these always showing up in slasher movies? You know, I have a theory that somewhere in the film world, some crazy little man, maybe he time traveled, maybe he just had a Uh, very specific clairvoyance Uh and he knew that the station wagon was not long for this world yeah when you see the station wagon you know what era you're in the slasher movies uh they've stopped using the station wagon because we're out of that era but that's how you can identify immediately your vintage 80s slasher dumb is by that goddamn awful (laughs) ugly station wagon a convention that's continued into today has been the cats as well yeah the cupboard cats cats in the cupboard is uh, this thing that not? It's not a slasher thing. We can't call it a slasher. It's a thing. horror thing. It's a right? horror thing. But the slashers, I mean, slashers are well known for cheating, for doing uh, scare shots. Mm-hmm. And the the best way to do that is to have your character open a cabinet, look in a vase, turn on the shower, and a cat comes out. <laughs> right. Stuff like this, where they are in the most. Cats so, don't belong there. Exactly. Cats are just curious. And well, they, what's the one in this movie? They're, it's in the back seat of her car. Yeah. Why is there a cat in her car? It doesn't make any. Lucifer hangs out Lucifer in cars. Lucifer the cat. I guess. Well, they have to. They know that everyone is saying, "What the fuck is the cat doing in the car?" Because the first thing they do is explain, "Well, that's Lucifer. He hangs out in the parking lot and goes in people's car." You know what I mean? Because they know everyone in the audience is going. They're, at first, they're going. Oh my God. Oh, it was just a cat. And then they're saying, wait, what the fuck was that cat doing in the car? You have an opening here that merges our slasherdom with all of the, I'm just going to keep calling it the Italian shit so that when I mispronounce Italian things, people know that I don't actually have any idea what I'm talking about. All right. I know some Italian. When you uh, first told me to watch this film and I got a hold of it, and this was during a bunch of these movies uh, that that, that I was watching, um, I put this one on. And not knowing what I was looking at, you get an, uh, an opening that's almost like Team America. Yeah. Where, uh, so what you eventually find out is that it's on a stage. But what it looks like is the lowest budget 80s piece of shit film you have ever seen. And this part carries on for a while without you knowing that you're not actually in an alley on a street somewhere right. and just suspecting that, man, this film is going to be a rough ride. Well, and it's funny because when you were kind of going through the slasher steps, you asked me to throw in bad ones yes. and good ones, but yes. I didn't tell you which were <laughs> which the bad which. Yes. and which were the good. Yeah. You gave me like six or something. Yeah. And, uh, and I said, I want mostly good, but give me one or two bad just so I'll be surprised because that's how our Killapaloozas were going. Right. Yeah. It was a new exciting experience for me, mostly good, and then every once in a while there would be one that was so terrible 
that I enjoyed having that experience to kind of compare the rest of the stuff by. So you pull back and then you see, I think it's right about the moment where everyone starts dancing. Yeah. But you go, wait, what the fuck is happening here? And you pull back and it's a stage show. And so begins this marriage of the slasher stuff and what's called Jalo, which is, uh, I think it's Italian for Stephen King mm. is actually what that word means. <laughs> so the two guys we're covering on the show today, I mean, Argento and uh, Michael here, we also have uh, Mario Brava big in the genre we did Black Sabbath back mm. on that Music Box episode, which itself I don't know is really part of the genre, but the filmmaker certainly is. And then Lucio Fulci, who is really well known for doing Zombie 2. So it's not actually Italian for Stephen King. That's what we call a joke. But uh, it represents a lot of the psychological thriller stuff that here in the States we associate with Stephen King because somehow he has become synonymous with everything. Stephen King is synonymous with everything. Well put. So over there, that starts with pulp novels, and it starts with crime, similar as it does here, and then it kind of branches out, but people keep, in the way that, you know, we start uh, with a lot of Stephen King stuff, and we say, psychology, that's Stephen King, and crime, that's Stephen King, and the supernatural, that's bullshit, that's Stephen King, when really Stephen King writes these, uh, you know, (laughs) the funny thing about that is they're pretty formulaic, so Stephen King writes one book over and over, and from this one book, people go, look at all of these things that Stephen King has given to the world, and that's how I think that genre works over in Italy. There's also an element to that of eroticism and stylized art, which maybe could help out Mr. King's work quite a bit. I think that stage fright it's nearly satirical of the Jalo stuff. It's got, you know, in the very beginning, they're criticized for uh, the play that they're doing as if it's too erotic. Mm-hmm. I don't even really know what that means, watching this stupid play of theirs, but somehow too erotic. So we're talking about the eroticism of the genre. Uh, in the later scene, we see them spill fake theater blood. Somebody's getting drilled through the door and, and they they... Okay, this is a little bit difficult to explain, but they spill fake theater blood. Now, if this were Stephen King, they would spill fake menstrual blood and then really menstruate on top of the fake menstrual blood. Sure. But since this is an Italian film, they spill fake theatrical blood and then the character bleeds onto the fake blood and it's darker, it's richer, it's deeper. It looks more like blood. I mean, it's not really blood, okay? It's... A film. It's fake movie blood, but not fake theater blood. Exactly. As if to say we are elevated one level above, we can look in at the eroticism of the stage play and the fake blood of the stage play, and we're better than that. We're using real eroticism and real fake blood. But, you know, satire be damned, I think there are some really artistic scenes in stage fright. And that's one of the things that, frankly, just confused me the first time I saw it. Because I watched it with this mocking tone. Sure. Before I could learn to appreciate the uh, nut jobs in the real world. Before I could look at people who are crazy and just go, wow, that's a great part of humanity. That's something as ridiculous as that exists. Mm -hmm. And so I'm watching Stage Fright thinking, well, maybe it's one of the bad ones or with this kind of mocking tone. And then every once in a while, it would do something extremely creative or just extremely gorgeous and I would be drawn back into the art side of this and go, well, I need to start taking this film seriously. Look at this, these cool things right. that it's doing. And then the annoying character gets ripped in half. And once again, <laughs> right. you're along for the ride. Yeah, it's right. Fun. Right. It's a fun time. But then by the time you get to the end, I mean, that scene you have where all the bodies are on the stage and the feathers are yeah. falling from the sky. Sure. And the scene itself, it's very delicate and it's very precise. It lets you know that, you know, it's not as simple as dismissing the film. You're having, uh, I don't even want to say the good and the bad that come together here, but just the average uh, self-aware type thing we're used to seeing in, uh, you know, in the Jason franchise, meeting a new sense of artistic experimentation. This is a, this is a crew. This is a director specifically who's decided I'm going to make a slasher movie and God damn it. I want to put artistic scenes in it. So I'm going to insert them without any kind of hint of irony or this is what this means about the film in a broader sense we're just on a fucking stage and there's feathers falling from the sky and i'm gonna show off at this point it's showing off Mm -hmm. that's all it is even as that scene ends you're watching it from under the stage and you have uh the feathers coming through eventually the owl is on fire and suddenly it feels very dramatic and very serious And I think that fucks with the audience a little bit. It certainly put me in a position where I didn't know how to feel about the film. And still, when those scenes come back up, you know, I tell myself in my head when stage fright starts 
that, all right, this is going to get kind of serious and beautiful and glorious at the end. And it just keeps bringing me back to the survival pack is running around and people are getting drills through their uh, abdomens. And then it comes back to the owl and I'm confused again. (laughs) Beautifully, wonderfully confused. But although maybe I can't explain it very well, I think there's a character in here who represents, at least to my knowledge at this point, everything I know about Italian cinema. Uh, This character represents how I feel about the directors. And that is the director of the play Mm -hmm. itself. I mean, when we get the opening, um, the, you know, the actors are taking things seriously, although some of the actors are not serious. The, the fucking guy who's supposed to play Irving, Irving Wallace, 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 the actor. Yeah. So the Irving Wallace actor, owl killer guy, he's in another film that I'm going to try really hard. And please email us double feature show at gmail.com. If you agree, I'm going to try to get Eric to do house at the edge of the park on the show. I don't know what that is. It's another Italian film, but there's a lot more penis shooting. <laughs> okay. I'm in. not defining what that means. Uh, what? So this character is our, he's our, he's our slasher comic relief made yeah. famous by the Friday, the 13th franchise who for a nauseating five or six, yeah, or I think it's six, nine maybe more or 10 <laughs> yeah. films has a comic relief character who makes jokes and not only are his jokes bad? And not only does the audience groan and roll their eyes every time he opens his fucking mouth, but so does everyone in the film. Yeah, It's right. as if nobody likes this character, and even the people who wrote the film went, we hate this guy, Right. everybody hates this guy, we don't know why he's here. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's how you get away with, I mean, in a, in a script where you have cheesy dialogue, If you were to hand me a script and you wrote something extremely obnoxious and I was not allowed to change it, what I would do as a director to combat that is just have everyone else in that scene turn and look at them as if they just said something really stupid. So now it's no longer the film saying something stupid. It's one retarded it's, guy so in the film. So you have a scapegoat character yeah. To, <laughs> yeah, right. to work out. It, he, so basically you're saying maybe the director looked at the characters, went, this guy has the worst yes. dialogue. Yeah. And he All would, of the other characters will be aware contrast, of that. By yeah, contrast, everybody yeah. will seem a lot less cheesy than this gay owl guy. The director is the opposite of that character, the polar opposite. You know, he tells that character, um, for instance, your character will no longer be an anonymous owl. Great. Now we know our killer is Irving Wallace, not an anonymous owl. But this play for him is life and death. There is nothing in the world more important and sacred than his play. And as you see the events that are taking place on stage, there's almost a slapstick quality to how insane they are, how not serious they are, how comedic they are. Yet when the camera turns around and looks at the director sitting in the chair, he is stone faced, dead serious, looking at it, evaluating everyone's Mm -hmm. performance, a precision, the precision that I talked about within the film. You're seeing that of the director He's going, all right, and this is the part where the owl in the leotard does a flip and then the characters over here need to convey some kind of emotion. Sure. This is dead fucking serious to him. And then you look back at the stage wondering, wait, so what is he evaluating? Wait, and why it's is just... she making out with this mannequin? <laughs> yeah. And it's just people dancing around and being idiots once again. And that's how I view Italian horror directors. Well, it's also possible that this director, having worked with the next director that we're about to cover, right. maybe he was making a jab. Yeah, I he mean, could be. You and, sure. I both, you and I both kind of have... I'm not going to say bounding experience in Argento, Dario Argento, Mm -hmm. but I think we both kind of know how he is as a person. Yes, he's a crazy person. That's exactly how he is. Um, I guess we forced ourselves into talking about uh, phenomena. So let's get to the Dario Argento stuff. To come back to Jalo for a second, there's another component of that we didn't see a lot in Stage Fright, maybe because Stage Fright is almost a commentary on some of the Argento stuff. But it's the supernatural and the paranormal. Yeah. Uh, that's what leads me to make the Stephen King jokes over and yeah. over. Supernatural and paranormal. Yeah, for me, Stephen King is supernatural and period blood, man. That's all it's I It's the ever American care. eroticism that he's bringing yeah, to the table. Yeah, dude. Chicks menstruating all over. That is erotic. All right, stop it. You're making me hot. So what I wanted to ask you is why do you think these two things constantly get associated? Menstrual over there, blood and over Italian here? people? Well, that's another topic for another show, maybe. But uh, psychology... And the supernatural, always hand in hand. You do a psychological thriller, but it also has to have ghost shit or paranormal shit. And for some reason, that marriage, 
I hesitate to say it works, but it certainly occurs over and over. Here's here's my theory on that, and I think that it has to do. It's more of a sum of the two parts working separately. Mm-hmm. If that makes any sense. No, it doesn't. Please Great, elaborate. Let me explain. <laughs> right. So psychological stuff is all about, you know, the human mind. And let's be real honest. There's philosophy shit that we covered. I don't remember which of these films talks about philosophy. I think it's actually stage fright. Somebody's reading a dumb fucking philosophy book. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Turns out people are boring. Turns out the stuff that goes on in people's heads may be fascinating on a scientific level, may be fascinating watching nerve endings fire and axons and synapses blast off down your fucking leg when you're being electrocuted. But people don't ever think anything very interesting. Another thing is, supernatural stuff is dumb because it's not real. Now, if we could make our brain be interesting and supernatural stuff real, then we have a fucking movie. Uh, maybe it's just the humanistic part of me that has a real problem going, human beings are boring. Well, I just mean psychology is boring. Yeah. I mean... Psychology does nothing for you. It doesn't do anything for me, and... And I guess people are trying to combat that. I can understand the science of psychology, you know, Mm -hmm. why people are the way they are. But in a psychological thriller, it's always they they take the wrong side of it because they're going for the supernatural because they have to take the theoretical end of psychology. And that's the boring part of psychology. That's the fucking stupid because a lot of it's made up. A lot of it's Freudian, Carl Jung, blah, blah. I'm talking out of my ass and I'm talking to bugs. Yeah, I think it's lazy. I mean, that's yeah. my, I'm not saying that you, uh, you know, it, it sounds like your position is that you can't make a psychological movie that doesn't have something to pique your interest. I mean, I think you could uh, certainly make a movie just showing a person going insane, right. showing a sure. person losing it. I mean, you don't need a, a supernatural twist to make that better. Right. You just have to fucking do your job and mm-hmm. it's hard. It's a lot yeah. easier when ghosts appear into the frame right. because then you look at ghosts and you don't pay attention to the poorly woven narrative right. or the uh, underdeveloped it's just, characters. It's just bullshit on both ends yeah. when these films come out. The thing that it accomplishes very quickly is that your characters question their sanity. You know, you have to find something really connected to a character in order to make them question their sanity if everything in your film is going to be normal looking. Uh, That is a big challenge, so much so a challenge that as I'm saying this right now, I'm searching for an example and I can't find one. But man, if you want to show a character breaking down mentally, then, you know, look back at when we talked about The Shining. I mean, there's a perfect example of how do we know the character is breaking down? Well, he's seeing all sorts of weird shit. There's ghost people wandering around. The house is doing crazy stuff. So we know, we know at that point Mm -hmm. that he's breaking down. It's a lot harder to show that when a character is just talking to themselves or can't find their keys right. or something a lot more mundane, something that people wouldn't uh, wouldn't find nearly as interesting. You have to have a director behind that or a cinematographer or an art department who has some real fucking vision to make something like that work. That was a long way to answer that question, but finally we have narrowed down why these two things always come together. You know what I think was a good example of that? I mean, there's the Italian film, The Black Cat, which operates in uh, that genre we keep referring to. But also the movie The Black Cat that we saw at the music box. Okay, yeah. I know that show hasn't gone up yet. It'll go up soon. But there was a perfect example of someone who is just falling apart mentally. uh, And you didn't necessarily need things to get... I guess things got a little bit weird in that movie. But certainly an example of where that comes Mm -hmm. up. So the other thing I wanted to ask you is, what is the association between insects and the human soul? Is it because of the multifarious mystery of them both? No. <laughs> um, I'm just going to go ahead and say that there's no connection whatsoever between bugs and the human soul. And furthermore, no connection between bugs and humans, no connection between humans and souls, no connection between souls and 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 don't say it don't say it don't say it if you say there's no connection between bugs and souls you're gonna make dario argento very angry i'm sorry and you would not like him when he is fucking angry so i love this guy and i love him maybe except for but more likely because of the fact that he is crazy i mean to go back to people are boring psychologically i would love to get inside dario argento's head because i think the guy is uh He is so far away from what I consider the norm, but even further away from what I consider myself as a rational human being. Just to have a conversation with this person, it is like talking to someone in an insane asylum. So in preparation of the show, I was reading a bunch of interviews with him, 
And in all of these interviews, he's expressing his sadness that people kill bugs. And um, I mean, I can kind of understand he's he's appealing to my sense of, you know, the animal rights movement and mm-hmm. what I what I find hypocritical about that in that people want to save cute and cuddly bunny rabbits and they want to save the dolphins. But no one has a problem with squashing a fly. Some people have a problem like Jennifer Connelly does with squashing a fly. Right. But most people save the cute animals and let all the bugs and stuff die. They're not important. They're kind of gross. They annoy me. So I'm going along in this interview and I'm agreeing with he with uh, what he's saying or I'm understanding it. I guess I'm not agreeing with it because I kill bugs and I have no problem with uh, killing and eating animals. Despite the fact I'm a vegetarian, no problem with killing and eating animals. But then he starts talking about how this is really a tragedy, Michael. It is tragic because bugs do have souls. And also, by the way, they're telepathic. That is what he said in the interviews. Bugs do have souls and they're telepathic, exclamation point. Well, the film kind of actually points that out and says it's not unnatural, or it's not, what is it? It's not unusual for bugs to have limited telepathic abilities. <laughs> yeah, that's in not which unusual case, In which all. case, Jennifer, sure. Jennifer goes, I'm, I'm pausing because she pauses. She goes, but am I unusual? As if that's the question there. Right, right. As if she goes, well, yeah, f- d- bugs, yeah, hello. Of course they have. Tell well, tell me something I don't know. But am I a weirdo? Yeah, right. Whoa, 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 hold on. Humans with telepathic powers. Humans talking to bugs. And I love those leaps in this movie to say, all right, all bugs have telepathic powers. This we know. This has been proven. It's like when people say, uh, when they talk about auras, and they go, well, this much we know. You can scientifically photograph the human aura. I mean, we've, we've established that. Okay. When... That is total bullshit. But wait, can I talk to bugs? Is there something odd about that? Uh, you know, the, the part we get toward the end with the, the buddy fly element, and Jennifer's character is following around buzzy a fly. Buzzy cop. Yeah, we, yeah, buzzy cop. That's nice. Um, we're following a fly to a crime scene. We have no problem with the fact that Jennifer can communicate with the fly, that she sees the fly in the box, that they have a telepathic link. But then there is a moment where she gets off the bus and both you and she lets the fly out. And you and I both go, wait, hold on a second. You can't follow a fly. That's impossible. (laughs) Have you ever tried even swat a fly? You don't know where they go. They're buzzing around. It's like that episode of Breaking Bad. And so that's beyond our suspension of disbelief. We took for granted all of the communicating with the flies summoning the flies flies attacking your aggressors and opponents but at the point where you have to follow a fly that's too much that's beyond the realm of what's acceptable well they do this brilliant thing in the beginning with bugs where they have their bug specialist come in donald pleasance's character yeah and he starts essentially he starts dictating the science of bugginess (laughs) right um, bugology he calls it entomology but Entomology, while a science, is not demonstrated in this film. So he's investigating at that point the death of Vera, the girl we see in the sure, very beginning, right. who's uh, Dario Argento's daughter who he likes to use in a lot of his films. So he starts dictating his kind of CSI method of how he can find out when people die just by how long bugs have been on them, what right, bugs are right. on them, you know, how big the bug party is on their severed head. Yeah, all right. And... I guess that's easier to buy into than talking to flies. So the mm-hmm. graduation of integrating the insect, I guess, as insects as characters yeah, and, yeah. and players. You into start the story. slow and you work your well, way you up. You start to, slow, yeah. and furthermore, and most importantly, you start with the most explanation. Essentially, it, it starts with the information and then it just starts throwing new stuff at you mm-hmm. and it gets sillier and sillier. It's pushing everybody to see how far people can go right. up to the ending of the film, which, you know, we'll come back around to the ending. We're jumping ahead a bit. I did want to talk about uh, something that's going to throw people off if they've never seen Italian films before, or maybe because it's done so fucking magnificently, they won't even notice. But uh, you have the dubbing stuff going on. Yeah, in you here. do. And you have this in a lot of countries, uh, but you don't usually see that in films made in this country or a lot of times in English speaking films. But this was Dario's first film that was done in English, and even this film was still dubbed. Um, We've talked about poor dubbing on the show before, where you have to go in after you shoot and add in a line, and sometimes it doesn't match up. And because we're not used to doing it, we probably don't do it nearly as well as the Italians. I mean, for a movie from 85... Okay, here's the thing I I keep not saying. Movie's from 1985. It's an Italian-made film, and none of it was recorded on the spot. I, I shouldn't say that. 
there's a couple scenes where uh, Jennifer Connelly's character is talking to uh, Donald Pleasant, mm-hmm. and they uh, those scenes had sound sync on them. With the exception of that, no sound was recorded. All of the sound was added in later. And you see this in all sorts of Italian films, uh, all the way up into the 80s. And you know what? Even a lot of them today still dub in sound later, still record all of the stuff later. If you go back to Spaghetti Westerns, if you go back to uh, the Sergio Leone stuff, the good, the bad, and the ugly, all of that stuff, sound is recorded later and then stuck in the film. So this blew me away to figure this out the first time I started watching Italian films and go, really, every single one was dubbed? That's crazy. What's still crazy is that people use the technique today and defend it. Because I could see at the time, when we talked about Blair Witch, we talked about the mechanic in that of one of the, car- one of the cameras not shooting uh, sound. Mm-hmm. So you had to have the machine where you recorded the sound live and then you'd sync stuff up. It's what you use a clapboard for, the infamous clapboard. Uh, when you're, if you've ever seen any behind the scenes, anything right. you've seen, you know, seen one, take one and they smack it. And then you have that loud sound where you can sync up on your video. You can sync it up with your audio and everything is just perfectly in line. But what the Italians and many other people who still make films like this believe is that you can get a better performance when you separate the physical part of the performance with the audio part. Um, because I guess they're so used to doing this, it's just a pain in the ass when we think about right. doing it because you have to go back in and make what you're saying line up. But their mentality is you act out a scene and you try and get all of the nuances in your acting, how your body language is, how you react to certain things. And then you go in later and instead of trying to find a take as we do in American movies where you like the sound of your voice and how you set a line as well as what was happening in the frame – You get a frame where everything, you know, the take itself is fine and nothing was fucked up. There aren't, uh, you know, the boom isn't in the shot and everyone's performance is good. And then you can go back and try and give your best audio performance at the same time. Sounds to me like a huge fucking headache. Yeah. But apparently with practice, you can become awesome at this. I think you see certain actors who can do it a lot better in these movies. But line for line, I still think the dubbing in this... I mean, you don't even notice it by the end, right? I mean, it yeah, just... Yeah, well, I, I've watched so many of these movies. Yeah, with that could be it too. That I just don't even... I don't even think twice. I can tell, you know, I can tell if I sat and actually paid attention. Yeah. But I honestly... And it, it should be obvious now that you and I don't go into films to pick out poor dubbing. Yeah. That's not what we're watching films yeah. for. We try and avoid continuity stuff. We try and just look away from that. I think another reason uh, this is really prevalent in other countries is they don't always shoot their films in English, but the English market for films is really big. So, you know, if you're going to shoot a film in Italian, obviously you would want to have an English dub for a larger market. And one of the cool things, and we talked about this in Barbarella, actually, uh, but I believe in that film they just shot French versions. And it was French, right? An yeah, English version so. and a, a French yeah. version. And Jane Fonda did both of the uh, sure. both of the parts. Some actors didn't know French, so they right. you know they couldn't. Well, another technique that I've seen done that I don't really I, I should have done my homework on this, but I totally blanked and didn't realize that this was going to be topical information. <laughs> yeah, I've seen some films that are kind they're done split language where a handful of the actors are say Italian and a handful of the actors are right, say German, right. and essentially what's done is they shoot the film in with all actors speaking their native language. Mm-hmm. And then for the English version, everything gets subtitled and everybody's stupid. So nobody realizes when there's an Italian person yeah, versus a right, German person. Right. But in the German version, only the Italian lines are, are dubbed or all right, yeah, yeah, subtitled. Yeah. And then the German version, obviously it's the opposite. And I don't know if that's because there's some production split or maybe there's just, they're using different countries for shooting, but right, I've seen right. it done a few times. A lot of times I think you have the actors that you have and sometimes they know the specific language that would be optimal for the film and sometimes they don't. What you uh, have in a lot of these Italian movies is that people know several languages. So you have the added benefit of, you know, if you look at other Argento movies where he shot all in Italian, certain actors, a lot of the actors, would come back and do their own English dub. So rather than having the cheesy kind of dub where um, I think we started watching Let the Right One In and it was dubbed and we had to right. switch it over to subtitles, uh, where that was horrendous. You have the same actor coming back. They know how to give their performance, and you get the same voice that lines up with the face. While we're on the topic of sound, score and music, another big thing for Argento yeah, movies. For sure. 
Um, we have kind of a rock soundtrack. Who all is in this? Well, Goblin. Yeah, we'll get it, to the Goblin is, okay, stuff. Well, but there's a lot of other stuff. There's going some on too. borrowed from EMI tracks. Uh, they, yeah. They take an Iron Maiden track and yeah. a Motorhead track. It's uh, Flash of the Blade, right? It's in there twice. Yeah, it comes up and yeah, I don't always agree with the uh, vocalist of Iron Maiden. Andy Sex Gang, though, that's you're fine with that stuff. Yeah, you know, whatever. All right, but but the Iron Maiden, man, it is. Uh, it really shows the time, and I think that's probably better than to. You don't want to say a movie like Phenomena is timeless. You right. want to view it like it's a fucking mm-hmm. '80s film. And the metal stuff, it just gives it this signature that is so different right. from all of the other slasher stuff. Where how many other movies have an '80s, you know, prog metal kind of score? I mean, that doesn't ever More happen. More than I think Hollywood is willing to admit. Yeah, well, that's probably true. It's not just the rock stuff. It's uh, Simon Boswell who did the score for Stage Fright for Deliria as well and Goblin. So Goblin is this Italian progressive rock band. Uh, I don't know. Do you you know music stuff better than I do? As we talk yeah, about all the time on the right. show, how would you describe the music of Goblin? It's I mean okay. So progressive is a really good word. And is that I, and I like using rock, it. Right? I want to use it in in less of the genre sense. I want to okay. use it as an actual adjective for the music. It's progressing from the things that happened before. Is yeah, that, exactly. And they right. use a lot of weird instrumentation. The one track that always stands out for me, and maybe it's because it's the first one. Or maybe it's just because it's so amazing. But there's a track that they did for Suspiria, which is another Argento film. Mm-hmm. And the track is called Suspiria. It's the first track. It's I think it's the, the opening during the credits of yeah. the film. And the whole track is is chimes and didgeridoo <laughs> with yeah. heavy drums and bass. It's one of the strangest, but you can't stop listening. And it's so tense. You mm-hmm. know that these guys are really aware of of kind of creating mood with the music that they're making. It's music uh, more like what you would expect to see in movies. Right. But it was moving rock in a different direction, desperately in a different direction. It was trying its best right. to push things right. um, as far away from, you know, the standard idea of what you thought rock was while still being rock music. The first time Goblin scored something for Argento was uh, when they did Deep Red uh, back in 75 I think Argento had a fallout with the composer of the film. Can't imagine why. Maybe because he's a nut job. (laughs) And uh, so he brought in this rock band and they would write the music. He would give them one day to write and then one day to record. And they would just write a piece. They would go in the studio and record a piece and then write another piece and record another piece. And they ended up working with Argento on, I would say most, not all, but most of his movies, even after they split up, you know, they split up some years later, I think 78 or 79 or something and still continued to work with them. You know, we see them on this movie here in 85, although they're uh, credited not as Goblin, but as the individual members mm-hmm. of the band. I think they just reunited for a tour in the last couple of years, I some think kind I of UK tour or 09 or 2010 or something. Yeah, we should go over to Europe and follow them around. <laughs> follow Goblin around on tour. On another weird musical note, just because this will make you nuts if you don't know what this is from, but we had one of those moments that you and I have... Um, with a band we mutually listen to where uh, there's a lot of samples in the music yeah. and they come up in films every once in a while and we go, oh, that's where that right. sample is from. I've been listening to this uh, hip hop album on repeat. It's a Sage Francis album and the song is called Sun vs. Moon and it uses a sample of the We Worship You scene, yeah. the scene where they're all the, the mean girls are all picking on poor Jennifer. They're really, really mean to her. What we didn't talk about are all of these insane moments at the end of the movie. Uh, This is probably, if I can take a guess, why you say you like the movie being an hour uh, or, you know, 110 minutes rather than 80 minutes. Yeah, I want to... You like to prolong the period that you like. I want to watch as much of the film before the ending happens. Before the crazy happens, yeah. So much goes wrong at the... Before we started recording, I was conjecturing that maybe they knew that the ending was crazy. Then again, Mm -hmm. it's... 
Argento, so who really knows? But I would like to at least think that they knew that the film was really strong for the first part and that they had a bunch of crazy shit that no one was going to accept. As if they couldn't push it out of the movie, right? Right. As if, oh, we need to, uh, in order to make the metaphor of the bugs work, we also need Demon Face Child. We need Demon Face Child. You know, we can't just cut that out of the movie. That would be impossible. But I was just thinking maybe they knew the early part was great and they had to piss all over the ending instead of pissing all over the entire film. So rather than getting Demon Face Child throughout the movie or Homicidal Monkey, which you don't like throughout the movie, um, I love Homicidal Monkey. Okay, so here's why. After you have the the fall into the pit of bodies, which is pretty messed up. Yeah. And then you have the stuff with the kid's face where the kid is crying until he turns around. And and then then he roars and becomes an evil. Yeah, he has demon spirit going on in there. Uh, all the stuff with the insects where she's summoning the insects for the last time. Then the fucking lake is on fire. Yeah. I mean, it's really, they're just throwing everything into the, this is obviously the climax sure. of the film. They want to make sure, they want to make sure there's no confusion about that. Lake is on fire, check, pile of bodies. All right, that's fine. Demon face child coming back with that, uh, the spear weapon. What, is, what a strange weapon too, yeah. for a slide. It, you, it's like the, self-assembly it's a collapsible uh, spear some kind of pointy curtain rod or something yeah. that he's attacked it's now, airplane friendly i think that the kid is attacking people and the mom's defending the kid i'm okay with that but i can get I, on board i don't know if that's provable within the film itself but none of that stuff matters uh what matters for me is that you have john mcgregor donald pleasant's character and his monkey and that his monkey so the monkey is his nurse mm-hmm. um I don't know if that makes sense it either. If you were in Continue. a wheelchair, do you need a helper monkey? Not any more than I need a helper monkey right now. All right. So what you're saying is we should all have helper monkeys. I can't say that I'm not saying that. <laughs> so through the whole movie, you're following around uh, Jennifer, and then you're kind of going back to the cops, and you're going back to John McGregor. Now, this is why I like this, and you disagree with this, and maybe I'm going to stick to it just because I like the phrasing, but the thing I always loved about Phenomena is that the monkey is the Ahab. Yeah. And you don't know if the monkey is the Ahab. I disagree fervently. With... All right, can I give you my pitch for monkey as the Ahab for All a right. second? All right. So you're following around Jennifer, right? Uh-huh. And you're following around the cops, and you are following John McGregor, whose monkey is helping him in everything that he does. Okay. Okay? He's a helper monkey. So if you could accept that John McGregor's character is the Ahab, I think you could also accept that the monkey is the Ahab. Am I stringing you along so far? Uh, Yeah. All right. So it would be a lot easier if all I had to really do is convince you that John is the Ahab because it's, it's Loomis, right? It's Loomis from the Halloween movies. So instantly, if he just puts on the right coat, he's the Ahab Uh and that's all you need, but he is helping her get to the killer. Uh He's telling her the stuff about the bugs and the connection. He gives her the fly. He's the one at home doing the homework. He's not directly chasing the killer as the Ahab usually is in these movies. By the way, uh, Behind the Mask is where we Mm -hmm. talked about Ahabs, if this isn't making any fucking sense to you. Uh, He's not out there really tracking the killer down, but come on, Michael, he's in a wheelchair. I think you're just being biased against the handicap. Here. Here's here's why I disagree with your vicarious monkey nurse Ahab theory. Look, I tried really hard, didn't I? I mean, you have to at least applaud my effort here. Yeah, I guess. So one, Donald Pleasance is not the Ahab, because in order to be the Ahab, you have to have a past with the killer, and you have to be independently trying to find the killer, not brought to the killer by the survivor girl. In um, a story this convoluted, you don't think I could find some link if I strained to Donald Pleasant's character? You could Pleasant's try really hard, and... but then you'd have to link that to the fucking monkey, okay. which does not <laughs> All right. work. All right. Also, the monkey doesn't ever once come in contact with the actual killer, if the killer is in fact the child. The monkey kills the killer's mother, which is way more of a Jason thing than it will ever be an Ahab thing. Okay, so I would have to say then that the mother is the killer, and that would help me in that scenario, but I still need need the monkey to have a past with the mother. You're saying (laughs) that's that's the missing piece to monkey is the Ahab. I need to prove that the mother had a past with the... Maybe the monkey is the one who raped her, and And that's that's why why there's a demon child. Wow, this has gotten so offensive. All right, I'm willing to just leave it at the monkey cuts her throat at the end, and that just makes me super happy. All right, well, I already mentioned that if you want to make Eric watch House at the Edge of the Park, email us at doublefeatureshow at gmail.com. I'm pretty sure I just said I would watch that with you. Yeah, just email Eric, convince him to watch it. Whatever. 
Also, doublefeatureshow.com if you want to go and download all of the fucking <laughs> other shows we referenced yeah, right. in this show. Uh, what else we got? So even without carnival names, people continue to donate to this show. So thanks for that. We got donations from Holly, from Mike, and another one from Sheila. So thanks a ton, guys. I know we're still kind of up in the air as far as what we're doing. We've been getting a lot of really great ideas on the Facebook page, and I think we have one kind of picked out. We're going to iron some stuff out with that, but in the meantime, glad people are still willing to contribute to the show. If you want to send a donation, go to donate.doublefeatureshow.com. And of course, everybody who donates will be eligible for that, uh, whatever the fuck it is we're going to put together, which will be awesome, by the way. So uh, we have two movies coming up next time. It's double feature. What are the movies? We're going to do 300 and Rambo. That's Rambo 4, the fourth film in the trilogy. All right. So should people see all the Rambos? Is that what's We're going gonna on? We're going to cover here? Rambo 4, okay. the fourth film in the trilogy. So this is going to be a weird thing for us, and we'll talk about it. But I do think people should just see Rambo 4. I mean, they can see the others if yeah, they want. Sure, independently. But don't, don't say, oh, man, I can't tune in next week or I can't listen to that part because I haven't seen all the Rambos. There's a reason we're not doing all the Rambos. There's a reason we paired Rambo 4 with 300 because we want, I think that people who listen to the show for shit like Phenomena, for slasher stuff, people like gore or blood, that is enough to get them to come to Rambo because that is what is on display there. If you like something like 300, maybe not even specifically 300, but stuff in the genre or stuff that is gory or bloody. Something or really historically accurate. No, not that. Uh, then you can watch Rambo. So I encourage you, just challenge yourself if you don't like the Rambo stuff or you're not into Stallone. Fucking watch it anyways because there's some interesting stuff there. So what you're saying is watch more fucking film. Whoops. Bye.